Uh, before I introduce Mayor Gray, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of distinguished guests. We have the uh, Bureau of Fire Chief, Tim Gregg, present. We also have Rick Gray's wife, Gail, a noted local artist. And our chief of police will also be joining us. Um, he's not quite here yet, but uh, <laughs> Keith Sadler will be here shortly. Uh, Richard Gray, J. Richard Gray grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, graduated from the American University and Dickinson School of Law. He began his legal career in Pittsburgh in 1969 as a VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, volunteer attorney with Neighborhood Legal Services. He then served as director of Central Pennsylvania Legal Services here in Lancaster. In 1976, he went into private practice as a defense attorney. Mr. Gray was first elected mayor of Lancaster in 2005, then re-elected in 2009. He was named chair of the Chesapeake Bay Alliance Local Government Advisory Board. He was also named the 2011 Elected Official of the Year by the Central Pennsylvania Chapter of the American Public Works Association. His vision of sustainability includes Lancaster's green infrastructure plan for managing stormwater, as well as other model initiatives in the realm of quality of life, economic development, and sustainability. I might add that uh, Mayor Gray walks the walk, literally. He does walk to work. He lives downtown in a row house with a great backyard garden. So he doesn't just talk sustainability. He actually, he does it. Uh, during his tenure, Lancaster has been transformed into a regional arts and cultural center that combines historic preservation with investments in modern amenities. And for those of you who, students and others who haven't been around Lancaster for too long, uh, all the things, you, all the cool things you notice happening in Lancaster the first Fridays, the arts, the music, the crowds downtown, they weren't there 10 years ago. This is all very recent and very positive. Mayor Gray is also an active member of the Mayors Against Illegal Guns. He and his wife, Gail, noted local artist, are collectors of mid-20th century dinnerware. Mayor Gray is also an avid motorcyclist. He rides a Harley, more than one. And he loves to cook Italian meals, northern Italian meals. It's my pleasure, pleasure to present Mayor Richard Gray. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I was trying to think if I had ever been in the, the gym before for, for other than a sporting event. And Tom reminded me there used to be some big concerts in here in the late 60s and early 70s. And, I had to tell him if I was at those during that period, I probably wouldn't remember it. Uh, you know, I had a conversation with your prior president, John Fry, one time, and I said to him, I said, you want to make this city a place where students want to come to get an education. I want to make it a place where people will stay after they've gotten their education. And John corrected me, and he said, no. He said, I want to do both because of the same thing. That's really what we've been trying to do uh, for Lancaster. We've been trying to make Lancaster a place that's inviting, it's open, uh, and it's an interesting place to live. With this speech today, I should tell you that uh, I spent about two weeks preparing another speech and then was advised this morning that no, they wanted me to talk just on Lancaster, basically. I had a speech uh, prepared about uh, the partisan problems with our country and where they're leading us and how they're really, in my opinion, a threat to democracy. Uh, that speech was five or six pages long, so you're probably going to be spared uh, all the extra time. But if you ever want to invite me back, I've got, I've got it in the can right now, so we're ready to go. We will bring it back. You know, in the city, uh, uh, you have to think, first of all, of what a city is. And if you look at cities through history and you think of the cultural and intellectual advancement of uh, people through the ages, really those advancements and those cultural changes have taken care, or taken place in the city. It's where intellectual curiosity is nourished. Uh, in Lancaster, we have the advantage, and these are some of the assets of our location, 
People, when I travel, say, where is Lancaster? And I tell them, well, it's the edge of the East Coast. Uh, and they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, you know, if you get much farther west, and Gail and I used to live in Pittsburgh, when you get much farther west, really, you lose touch with the East Coast. In Lancaster, I can go into Philly for the Eagles games or Sixer games or Phillies. I can be at the Jersey Shore and get up Monday morning at 6 o'clock and be in Lancaster and work. We can take a train to New York and go to an art show, have an early dinner, take a train back, be back by 8 o'clock, drive down to D.C., go to an art show, have a dinner, be back easily, uh, take advantage of Baltimore and the Inner Harbor. We're right here on the edge of it, and the edge of megalopolis. Yet, on the other hand, we don't have to put up with the disadvantages of megalopolis. I tell people that Lancaster doesn't have a rush hour, it has a rush minute. And, and if you have to sit through a light for two changes, people are outraged around here. Uh, every now and then we get caught in Washington or Baltimore traffic, and Gail and I just say to each other, how do people deal with this? How do they put up with this? Uh, because not only is it located that, uh, in that uh, location, it's also representative of a new urbanism. You, you've heard the cliché, everything old is new again. New urbanism is a movement that's taking place in the country, and it's probably uh, 15 years old now. The idea is to des design urban communities in a way that basically they emulate Lancaster. And I'll give you some examples. New urbanism, high density, high density living is uh, one of the attributes of new urbanism. Well, Lancaster, you have 60,000 people basically in four square miles. You don't get a whole lot denser than that. They talk about walkable urbanity with new urbanism. Gail and I have uh, lived downtown for 40 years in the same house. I, I tell people it's the best $18,000 I ever spent. I've walked to work for 40 years. Gail has her studio a block away from our home, which now is on Gallery Row. It wasn't always Gallery Row, but uh, to say the least. Uh, but Gail can walk to her studio, and for 40 years we've met for lunch. Uh, it's a lifestyle that people think is unique, but really it's a lifestyle I grew up in. Really, I grew up in Pottsville in a row house. My father walked to work. My mother was a teacher. She walked to school. I walked to school. We walked downtown if we wanted something. Uh, and we weren't car dependent. Uh, mixed use, Lancaster didn't have a zoning law till the late uh, 1940s. Some people would consider that a disadvantage. Frankly, I consider it an advantage because as you go around the city and you look, there are so many corner stores that are now residencies but were built in a commercial way, built for commercial use. Zoning that we have right now is called Euclidean zoning because it comes from Euclid, Ohio, and it's use-based zoning. It segregates uses. New urbanist zoning is form-based zoning, and what that does is the initial question is not the use of the property. The initial question is, does it fit in the neighborhood? Are you going to put a 10-story building in a neighborhood with two-story houses? How does it fit? How does it affect the light? How does, uh, uh, if you build a big building across the street from a, a group of row houses, how does it affect the quality of life in those row houses? Does it belong there? Then secondary, you ask, what's the use? Now, in both kinds of zoning, you aren't going to allow a uh, tannery to move into a uh, neighborhood, in the middle of a neighborhood. Uh, but as part of uh, new urbanism, you look at what's the use or what's the uh, form of the property, form-based zoning, it's called. Lancaster pretty much has that, though we don't call it uh, that. That's what we look at, and that's what we talk about. One of the first things I did uh, uh, when I got in office was, I guess, if mayors can issue orders, I'm not big on orders, but uh, by the way, I, my window was stuck one of the first days I was in office, and uh, I called downstairs and said, hey, could you get somebody up here to get this window unstuck? And uh, the woman that works with me uh, has uh, 
sort of an assistant for 30 some years came in and she said, they said they want a, a, a work order. I said, a work order to get a window unstuck. Uh, and I said, okay, we'll tell them the mayor orders the window to be unstuck. And, <laughs> but if you look at the historical uh, bones that Lancaster has, a, a friend of mine visited from Pittsburgh, one of the, probably the best judge in Pittsburgh, real close friend. And as we drove around, he kept on saying, yeah, God, you, you tore so little down. There's so much still there. Well, as I said, when I first got in office, one of the first things I did is said, the mayor is going to have to sign off on anything that's torn down. I want to see what you're tearing down and why it's being torn down. Because some of the biggest mistakes made in Lancaster were where we tore things down and we tried to build, uh, uh, they called it urban renewal, you know, you could call it urban destruction, and we still pay for that in part of downtown and in southeast Lancaster. Uh, that said, we've learned lessons from that. And I'll give you an example. The stockyards, which I don't know if many of you are familiar with, as you go out of the city on the Lidditz Pike off to your right is the stockyards. It was at one time the biggest stockyard west, or excuse me, east of Chicago. It was a big stockyard. It had turned into a totally dilapidated mess, and finally I went out and just called in all the code people, called the fire chief, the police chief, and everybody went out and cited them for everything. And we said, this can't continue to exist in this state. So it was torn down. It was a feel of rubble. In fact, uh, people were saying to me, have you been by the stockyards? It looks so good. And I went out, and it was a feel of rubble. But uh, Gail and I looked at it and said, that does look good compared to the way it looked. They wanted to build a Walmart there. And they would have required a zoning change. And I said, no, you're not building a Walmart there. We don't need a big box store with a, a whole bunch of macadam in front of it uh, that'll be empty in six years. And we'll try to be figured out what to do. Well, the next thing was, well, a target. I said, well, there's a target out on Route 30. We don't need a big box store. And the director of economic development came to me and said, you know, you might leave office, and that might just be that field of rubble. And I said, if we haven't learned anything from what was done downtown with urban renewal, we should learn that you might be better off with a field of rubble rather than repeat the same mistakes and build something then that you're going to have to try to figure out what to do with at a later time. If it's a field of rubble, it's a field of rubble. In the interim, the guy started to develop an office park. They have green buildings there, LEED certified buildings. We have one spot we just about uh, finished. But the only reason it happened is we said no to Walmart. We said no to Target. We're not going to emulate that kind of thing, and we're not going to re repeat the mistakes of the past. Also, just a couple other things uh, with Lancaster. Gallup poll, and I forget the foundation, does a well-being poll. 350 days a year, they poll 1,000 people on their feeling of well-being, where you live, how you work, what your lifestyle is. And I got a call from a friend uh, who said, did you see Lancaster came in number one in the well-being poll? 350,000 people were polled uh, over a year's period of time. And I looked, and there for mid-sized cities was Lancaster, number one. Uh, and then I looked for standard metropolitan districts, which there are 190 of them in the United States. Lancaster County was number one as to how people felt about where they lived and uh, the environment that they lived in. Uh, in fact, my daughter lives in San Francisco. She runs the Cartoon Art Museum, and we went out and visited her, and she said, don't you love San Francisco? And of course, if you like cities, which I like cities, you know, how could you not love San Francisco? And I told her, I said, well, for 16, it's nice. You ought to come back and see what number one looks like. Honolulu was four, Boulder was like six, Lancaster was number one. Uh, uh, in addition, some of the other factors that we have here, and again, I'm talking about the assets of the city, the central market. CNN recently uh, published a, uh, an article on the 10 best public markets in the world, 10 best in the world. Two of them were in the United States. One of them was in Union Square, or at Union Square in New York City. 
The other one was our central market. Those were the only two in the United States as to public market. Uh, finally, with the assets we have, the Brookings Institution came here a few years ago, one of the fellows from the Brookings Institution, and did a study of Lancaster. And he reported that Lancaster has the opportunity to be the Santa Fe or Asheville of the Northeast. Uh, and then I, st I started to think about it. We have a great art scene here that's been here a long time. It's finally evolving into retail. It was There were a lot of artists here from the time we moved here 40 years ago. There have always been a lot of artists in Lancaster. And I ascribe it one sort of a reflection of how much uh, uh, money artists make. It's, it's uh, cheaper to live here than it is in Philadelphia or Baltimore or Washington or New York. You have easy accessibility. But also, I felt it was the beauty of the place. Gail, I brought Gail here on a motorcycle ride from Pittsburgh 40-some years ago. Just took her through Lancaster, and she said, if you ever want to move to Lancaster, I'll move there in a second. Uh, and, what, three months later, we were living in Lancaster. Uh, sort of shows you how decisions are made in our house. Uh, but. You know, the Brookings Institution said this about Lancaster, and we thought about it, and we tend not to think of ourselves in that big a term. Uh, and I thought about it. Well, you know, the Santa Fe, well, it depends on Los Angeles and the rest of the, the West Coast, really, to support the art scene in Santa Fe. Asheville certainly isn't supported by the people in Asheville. Uh, it's people in the surrounding areas, and the, you know, North Carolina and whatnot, that go to Asheville for art. Uh, and we thought, you know, why couldn't Lancaster be the Santa Fe of the Northeast? What's in competition with it? So we have those assets. We also have uh, problems. One of the initial problems is the government structure in Pennsylvania. I tell people that in the Balkans, when they want to talk about dividing up into little segments of government, they talk about not Balkan eyes, but Pennsylvania eyes. Uh, really, because we're worse than the Balkans. Uh, there's 60 local governments in Lancaster County. 60 local governments. Uh, there's 16 school districts. There's one school district in a county in Maryland. There's 16 in Lancaster County. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's 60 planning commissions, there's 60 zoning boards, there's 60 CEOs, there's 60 governing bodies. Uh, the county planning commission is just advisory. It can't even control what you do on the local level. So you end up with just plans that aren't coordinated properly. You end up with business people coming in and saying, who do I deal with here? Why is it different than the guy across the street? Uh, it's a, it's a really a, a horrible problem. Uh, add on to that the fact that, well, when people ask me how big Lancaster is, I tell them it's between 200 and 250,000 people. Uh, and I'm the mayor of Center City, basically. Because if you had annexation, which you don't really in Pennsylvania, uh, you couldn't just move across the street and then point back and say, that's your problem. You couldn't... Uh, uh, you, you couldn't, with poor people, with crime, with other problems that need to be addressed, you couldn't, again, move a block or two away and uh, suddenly it's not ours. If you drive up Queen Street, I'll give you an example. The block before the train station, you're in Mannheim Township until you hit the train station, then you're back in the city. That kind of thing uh, is all over the place. The, the police used to tell a joke that uh, it's a busy Friday night and somebody calls them and says there's a dead body on Liberty Street. And the dispatcher says, what side? And they said, the south side. And they tell, the dispatcher says, well, we're busy. Drag it across to the north side and call Manheim Township. <laughs> Funny, but uh, unfortunately uh, uh, so true. Uh, Pennsylvania, as a part of that, too, has over half of all the municipal pension plans in the United States are in Pennsylvania. 
Lancaster City has three pension plans, police, fire, non-uniform. It has three economic advisors. It has three investment advisors for a city of 60,000 people. How efficient is that? You, you know, you figure it out. Uh, also, another problem is poverty. You know, in the current campaign, all the, the middle class this and the grow of the middle class and do this for the middle class and, you know, the rich and the middle class. The average median family income in the city of Lancaster is $32,000 a year. Family income, $32,000 a year. Is that middle class? When you have people that are worried about whether they're going to eat, uh, a lot of the issues that are discussed on the national level just uh, don't resonate. I started my practice in, as a VISTA attorney. I made 4250 a week practicing in Pittsburgh. People asked me how you could live on it. I said, it's more money than I've ever had before. Uh, but you, you got educated as to the problems of the poor. There was a, a, a legal or a VISTA training session for lawyers, and they wanted to send two of them to Ralph Nader uh, and work with Ralph Nader and a group of us organized and said, poor people don't care about seat belts around an empty belly. And really, we've got to start facing the fact that there's poverty in this country, there's poverty in this community, and it's not just the middle class. I mean, we are blessed, the people in this group, we are lucky, uh, but again, median family income, family income, $32,000 a year. We have an over-reliance on property taxes, and that's when uh, about a third of our property in the city is tax exempt. The only real tax that the city of Lancaster can impose and raise is property taxes. And somebody said to me one time, yeah, you know, uh, Tenants don't have to pay property taxes. Well, show me the landlord that when we increase the property taxes, isn't going to increase the rent. And I'll show you the landlord that's uh, hanging on to the edge, really. Uh, we tax poor people to pay for services for the county. We subsidize the county of Lancaster. They have a million and a quarter worth of property in the city of tax taxes that they would pay if they pay just the city taxes. And yet Chief Sadler and uh, Chief Gregg, they provide police and fire protection. We provide public works services to them. They don't pay taxes. We have a thousand people, a thousand kids a, a day that go to our public schools that are funded on property taxes, that are homeless, the kids are homeless. Now, how much does a homeless person pay in property taxes? Everybody else pays for that. So it's really stacked against us. It's stacked against us with annexation, that you can just walk away from the problems and say, that's not my problem. And it's stacked against us, too, with the taxing form. We've asked the General Assembly to give us a menu, let us create what would be the best taxing structure for Lancaster, for York, for Reading, for Harrisburg, for Mannheim Township? You know, let us figure it out on the local level. Uh, and what, what do you have in Harrisburg? This was my other speech. Well, what do you have in Harrisburg? Well, you have a group of politicians who really like what they got going for them. They are, they are district in such a way that they just have to get by a primary, the vast majority of them. The way you get defeated for re-election is make waves so you don't do anything. You don't do anything. And meanwhile, you push the problems down. Uh, and I'll give you an example. We have Act 111, which is the way that police and fire salaries, fringe benefits, work schedule, vacation, and whatnot is worked out. Act 111, a, an independent arbiter is selected basically by the union, more or less. And that arbiter, who does not have to pay any attention to municipal financing, determines salaries, 
overtime wages, when, uh, uh, what working conditions are going to be, fringe benefits. We currently spend about $21,000 a year per firefighter and police officer, and also for ASME employees, non-uniform uh, uh, non employees, for their medical care alone. Fifteen years ago, that was $4,000 a year. $21,000 a year. Now, they've just started to make a contribution up until the most recent contract. The most that anybody contributed to that was 500 bucks a year. Uh, and even that was with them kicking and screaming. How do you take a community that the average family income is $32,000 a year and pay 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 thousand dollars a year, plus 21 thousand dollars for medical, and probably another four or five thousand in other fringe benefits. How do you pay for that? How do you pay for that? And it's not to begrudge police officers or firefighters or any other public employee a reasonable salary for a dangerous and demanding job. I'm not getting down on them. I'm just saying, where does it come from? That's a constant struggle for us. We're working on the budget for next year. We're looking at a $4 million hole. A million and a quarter of it is pension for police and fire, and probably another hundred or million and a half of it are mandated salary increases. Where do we get that from? So it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, and you have uh, Harrisburg not really, not really responding. Why? Well, let's see, police union. Well, the Republicans love the police. The Democrats love the union. We're not doing anything that they don't want, really, is the response you get. You go up there, and even the most minor tweak, they, they run for cover. They run for cover. They don't, wanna, they don't want to run in that primary where the police union comes out and says, you're anti-police because you, you supported reform on the local level. You've done things against us. So it's a problem. It's a real problem. Add to that some unfunded mandates. There's a great book, Rights Gone Wrong, it's called. I, I can't remember the author's name. He's a professor at Stanford Law School. But he talks about how you take the civil rights mo model which was very appropriate in the 60s and is applicable to some other things, gay and lesbian issues, it's certainly applicable to. But you apply it to everything. You apply it to students who are, uh, have learning disabilities. You apply it to the uh, American Disability Act, to people that have a physical uh, handicap. And you make it in absolutes. Well. Who's a, whose job is it to implement that then? The federal government requires it. Four times a year we go to a federal judge who tells us what curb cuts to put in because my predecessors pretty much ignored it, which was not right either. But you can't decide now. Here's the resources we have. Where will they be most effectively used? How will we use them? We'll probably end up spending around $14 million on curb cuts. And again, we get out and talk to the judge, and the judge says, well, you should really do more curb cuts than that. Some, no offense, but some mainline judge who's probably never been in Lancaster and wouldn't nerve know it. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, some other things that we've had, uh, a public work system that was built literally centuries ago. Uh, I used to tell people with my Harleys, you change the oil regularly. It's cheaper in the short run. Don't change the oil. Just leave it alone. But in the long run, the engine wears out. Well, for politicians, and we have a joke around the office, somebody will say, oh, this has to be fixed. And whatever date it is, well, will it, will it last till 2013, which is past the next election? Uh, and then we get a laugh out of it. But that's been the attitude for a long time. Can we get past the next election? Why spend money on public works? Do you know whether your sewers are any good or not? Well, only if they clog up. That's the only time you know. Otherwise, uh, you don't know. So officials, public officials have a short shelf life, and they tend to look at not quarters but terms. Can I get through this term? 
it's hurt us in the long run. Uh, in fact, the old mayor of Reading and myself agreed that being mayor of a municipality about our size is a, a good end of career job. Uh, because if you do the right thing, you're going to upset, certainly upset a lot of people, uh, no question about it. So what do we do? And I don't want to be all negative and quite to the contrary. Well, first of all, we have a strategic plan, which I used to be chairman of the board of the American Motorcyclists Association. We spent a couple of years developing a strategic plan. The organization had 300,000 members and all the corporations were members. And it was about a two and a half, three inch thick strategic plan. And I'll never forget when we adopted it, the head of American Honda was sitting next to me and he dropped it on the floor and said, thank God we'll never have to look at that again. And we never did. I mean, it was a useless document. The city strategic plan I can carry around in my pocket. Uh, just our focus areas, the arts, business development, green and sustainable, neighborhood quality of life, and public safety. And we delineate in there not only the, uh, what the focus areas mean, but our priorities. And then we do something that's dangerous for politicians. Uh, uh, we list uh, success indicators. Have we been successful in doing it? Well, politicians don't like to list success indicators because if you run, what does the guy running against you do? Say, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do this. Uh, but if you don't set up some goal as to where you want to go, you'll never get there. I mean, I say in the, this thing, uh, it was a Yogi Berra quote who, uh, I don't know why he seems to make so much sense to me, but if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else, uh, which is... Uh, the basis of our strategic plan. Uh, one of the things that is important in it, uh, and extremely important, is the green and sustainable. We've made that one of the top priorities in the city. And I just want to read a little piece from Benjamin Franklin's will, since I'm at Franklin and Marshall. This was written in 1789. And having considered that conveying a ground plot, or covering a ground plot, with buildings and pavement which carry off most of the rain and prevent it soaking into the earth and renewing and purifying the springs, whence the, well, the water of wells must gradually grow worse and in time be unfit for use, as I find has happened in all old cities. And he goes on to leave 100,000 pounds of the city of Philadelphia to develop a waterwork system to bring water in. We have the same problem here. We've paved Lancaster. Lancaster has so much uh, impervious area that when it rains, water runs, needless to say, it can't go into the macadam so it, or into the roof, so it runs off and runs uh, in our stormwater system. Unfortunately, at one time, the thought was, put the sewerage and the stormwater together, that will dilute the sewerage, ergo, you know, it's no problem. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, what's happened as we've grown, and there's probably 150, 250 cities with this problem, as we've grown, when it rains really heavy, stormwater and wastewater are combined. Well, they all go to a treatment plant. Well, a treatment plant can't handle that. So what do we do? We screen out solids and dump it straight into the Conestoga billion gallons a year of combined stormwater wastewater overflow the city of Lancaster dumps into the Conestoga. Uh, now we knew that's a problem uh, and we knew that we had to do something about it. And the EPA, we were sort of going down through the cities and they were getting awfully close to us and started to ask us questions. And we thought, well, are we going to do this because we're forced to do it by the federal government, or are we going to do it because it's the right thing to do? And we decided we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And we've put an awful lot of money into green infrastructure in the city, and we're just beginning. We have a 25-year plan that at the end of that time, rather than take clean water and mix it with wastewater and dump it into the Conestoga or try to clean it, 
what we're going to do is keep the storm water out of the, out of the uh, uh, sewer system. We're doing all our parks one by one. Sixth Ward Park, probably very few of you know where that is, but Sixth Ward Park has a permeable basketball court that the kids love because it never gets wet, you know, it rains. The neighbors like it because when you bounce a ball on it, it doesn't make as much noise. We like it because underneath that we put a whole drain field, piped all the water from all around the neighborhoods there, and 750,000 gallons a year goes into that park rather than into our stormwater system. We've done the same with Brandon Park. We're about with Crystal Park. Uh, Rodney Park, we're going to do it. We've developed a, uh, a system for road improvements in some of these uh, alleys, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of these private alleys, where we put a permeable strip down the middle of it, put concrete on either side of it, we make the alley passable, uh, and we drain water. When it rains, it's done in such a way that rainwater goes in there, goes to the permeable strip, and infiltrates. Uh, parking lots, our public parking lots, we've done a couple of them now, uh, where the water drains down to a permeable area and then, uh, in fact, I think F&M has, yeah, I know you have some of them here. Uh, so, tree planting, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention tree planting. We're trying to plant 3,000 trees a year. Uh, because of the amount of rainwater trees absorb, it never gets to the ground. And anybody that's been in a rainstorm and stood under a tree uh, knows that that's the reason you're there, because the rain isn't hitting the ground and you're staying dry. So rather than have the EPA dogging us about it and having some federal judge telling us you've got to plant this many trees, we now have Lancaster as a model community. The EPA, I was to a lecture not long ago, and the guy's flashing the slides up. Bam, up comes Lancaster, and he's saying to these other communities, you know, if Lancaster can do it, why can't you? In the last month, I've spoken in Washington, Baltimore, at the National Conservation Training Center. I just got a ticket. I'm going out to a conference uh, in Chicago. They all want us to talk about what Lancaster is doing with green infrastructure. So. Are we doing it because of the EPA? That certainly was, certainly put it in the front burner because we knew they were there. Uh, but now the EPA is finding money for us to do it, is finding bonds for us to do it, is finding different ways to finance us and using us as their model. We're using these parks for people who don't care about the Chesapeake Bay, which is probably most of the people in the city don't, they're not really relating to Chesapeake Bay, but they see a brand new park. They see a beautiful park, and they see a big sign that says green infrastructure at work. That they like. Uh, we're in the process right now of looking at possibly imposing a stormwater fee, that if you flush the toilet, you pay for, uh, for disposal of that. But if it rains on a parking lot and there's 10,000 flushes that go the same place, you don't pay anything. Well. One other city in Pennsylvania has a stormwater fee. That's Philadelphia. I think there's four or five hundred communities in the country have a stormwater fee. We're looking at it, and there'll be a big fall. They were all about it, and what are you doing? And how can you charge me for it? Uh, well, somebody's got to pay for it. We've got to do it. We're going to have to look at that closely. On the local level, if you're familiar with Simpson Bulls, we've done it already. The workforce has been cut by 15 percent, and taxes have gone up. And that's the bind we're in. Somebody said to me one day, boy, it must be hard deciding whether to lay people off or raise taxes. And I told them, we lay people off, we raise taxes, and we take from reserves. You know, it's not one or the other. It's how much of each. Uh, and until there's some reform on the state level, we'll continue to have those kind of problems. Now, the future, the arts continue to flourish. $36 million a year, a recent study found, are spent on the arts in the city of Lancaster. That has a multiple of $72 million a year in Lancaster County. So the arts are slowly moving into uh, uh, a real moneyed level. And as I said before, the arts previously were Gail and her studio and people like that, uh, uh, 
painting and in fact, Gail and a couple other people were the first people with First Friday around here. It was just two or three studios and galleries that would open. Sort of started that. But uh, we're getting into the retail level now where artists can actually support themselves with their art. Uh, she used to hate when I'd say this, but uh, I, if people would say, how do you be a successful artist around here, I'd tell them you marry a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> That's not true anymore. There are artists, including Gail, who uh, uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, we've seen that we can't develop ourselves out of the financial problems that we have. Doing redevelopment, doing uh, community development is good. It's helpful. It improves the city, improves the quality of life, gives job opportunities, provides new housing, but does not pay the piper. Maybe 20 years down the road it will, but right now it doesn't. And most of the development you see, they want tax breaks. They come in and say, what will you give me? I can go here and get this. And because of property taxes, we end up bidding against other communities. Well, we'll give you this, and we'll give you this, and we'll cut your taxes here, and we'll provide this. Uh, and it's because of property taxes. If they build on the other side of Liberty Street, and it's Mannheim Township, the city doesn't get anything. If they build on the south side of uh, Liberty Street, the city at least gets property taxes and a $52 a year per capita tax for their employees. So that's a situation. We need real government reform to, to uh, encourage shared services. There were 13 mayors. We had a meeting at the Arts Hotel. I set it up maybe five years ago. And the rule was, if anybody says politically we can't do that, they had to leave the room for 15 minutes. <laughs> and I said, let's talk about what we should do instead of what we can do. Because if you talk about what you can do, you'll never get around to what you should do. Uh, and one of the things they came up with, there should be economic incentives for communities to merge their police departments, merge the fire departments. If we had a metropolitan police department the well, city of Lancaster has about 140 police officers. If we had a metropolitan police department, it would probably be triple that, just from the communities that border on this city. Why don't we have that? Uh, the, future, uh, the future is really with the cities. There's no doubt in my mind. Housing patterns, I did a report for the Bar Association last year and did a study of what the housing patterns are and where people are moving. 80% of the people over 65 that move, move out of single-family dwellings. Of that 80%, only 40% of them go back into single-family dwellings. Multiple-family dwellings are what's, uh, what's happening, and cities are the place where they are. Another example is younger people. Richard Florida, with a creative class, his most recent book, uh, The Great Reset, he said, younger people don't want a house. Younger people come out of college with a bunch of loans and everything, uh, a bunch of payments they have to make. They, the job situation is a lot more fluid and changeable for your generation than for mine. My father worked for the same company for 45 years. Uh, that's rare today, to say the least. It wasn't in his generation. You got a job during the Depression, you kept it. You stayed there and you thank God you had a job. Your generation is going to move a lot more between jobs and whatnot. Florida says rental housing is the way that they want to go and where they want to go and where the future is. Again, the city's there to provide it. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The average age of the city of Lancaster is 30, which to a lot of you might seem old. To me, our youngest kid's 38, so uh, it seems pretty young. Uh, the lifestyle of the future both economically and culturally, is urban. When gas gets to be eight bucks a gallon, you want to walk to work and you want to sit out on Route 30 in, in a traffic jam. If you can walk or if you can work at home, uh, you have that advantage. We live downtown. We can walk to probably 30 restaurants. By the way, if you like Indian food, there's a great new restaurant that opened in downtown Lancaster on Orange Street right across from the Boulevard building. They have a, a luncheon buffet. I shouldn't be into They had a luncheon buffet. Four of us ate there. It was $33 for four people uh, for the buffet. Great tandoori chicken. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, the, city, the city is the place. If you look at what a generation before you were brought up on on TV, I'm not sure what you guys watch on TV. I, I watch sports and news, and that's about it. Uh, uh, my generation was brought up with Father Knows Best, The Life of Riley, Leave it to Beaver. Where were all those settings? Probably most of you don't know, probably. They were all suburbia. That was the lifestyle. That was the place to live. That was where you wanted to go. Look at the shows my kids were brought up on. Friends, Seinfeld, uh, Sex in the City. Where, where, were the, uh, where were the settings for those? They all urban settings. You live in urban settings. You live in apartments. Uh, that's being reflected in the housing trends in the city and in the country. We find more younger people moving in and more baby boomers who no longer want five bedrooms, three bathrooms, and an acre of grass. They want to be able to close the door, lock it up, and go to Florida for a month and not worry about it. They're moving into the city, too. So on that, uh, again, my, my other speech, if you want to hear it, I'll give it some other time. Uh, but. Uh, I think that's the report on the city right now. Oh, there you are. Oh, you're giving me the stop sign. And, uh, so I'll stop and ask for questions. <laughs> Any questions? My name is Evan. I'm an environmental science major. I'm wondering what is the role of green space and conserved land in and around Lancaster? Well, what is the role of green space? Well, we've made green space a priority, but also the, the role of it, again, we've made primarily dual function. We, we call it integrated infrastructure. Anything we do with the infrastructure, anything, and uh, our director of public works, who would be a great speaker here sometime, has a master's degree in environmental engineering. She looks at it and says, how can we incorporate green techniques and environmentally pr appropriate things in this? In addition, what we're going to do with a stormwater fee is provide credits to private entities that take stormwater out and do greening basically uh, on their own property. It's interesting, the city of Lancaster per capita has more green roof space than any other city in the United States. Now, it's one of the advantages of being a small city, you can get a statistic like that. We have 10 more green roofs planned in the city. Uh, so we're really, uh, we're really doing everything we can. In addition, one final thing, if you build a new property and you, uh, it's at uh, housing. You get uh, two years tax-free, three years if it's silver, four years if it's gold, five years if it's platinum. So we're encouraging anybody that builds a new thing, and that can be substantial, especially if it's an apartment building or something like that. We'll give you an extra two or three years without any taxes at all. If you're majoring in that, you ought to talk to Charlotte Katzenmoyer. I'm sure she'd love an intern uh, to work with her. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Brady. I'm a junior. Uh, my question is about uh, Lancaster's gentrification. And I was just really wondering uh, what neighborhoods are being targeted and how are you actually going about the gentrification process? Well, you know, gentrification is a many splendor word. Uh, it can be a good thing depending if you're the one moving in, and a bad thing if you're being the one that's displaced. What we've been trying to do is this. Uh, I'm a great believer in economic integration. Uh, the block we've lived on, at one time we used to kid that you had to have either a six-figure income or be on welfare to live in that block. And it was, that wasn't much of an exaggeration. Uh, what we're trying to do is not gentrify neighborhoods as such. What we're trying to do is bring all the neighborhoods up, and you, you see it. I go to all parts of the city. You see it where one house in a neighborhood that's not especially bougie or whatnot is fixed up. 
You come back a year later, there's two or three houses that are fixed up. It's the same, the opposite is true too. If you let it go run down. Uh, we have licensed, you have to register a, 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 a rental property in the city now. You have to license it annually and it has to be inspected for code violations. Now they're not going in and nitpicking the landlords, but to make sure that the property is habitable in a safe way, in a clean way, uh, that has made a difference in Lancaster. So again, what neighborhoods do you, do you target? That, to a certain degree, that just happens. But what we've been targeting really is more infill and individual homes and how we can do it uh, in all neighborhoods to just bring the standard of living up and the quality of life up. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a Philly fan, too. <laughs> Hi, my name's Ryan. Um, my question was, um, you mentioned poverty is one of the major struggles that, that the town faces. Um, and it gets, the word gets thrown around a lot, um, especially currently in politics. I was wondering if you could um, relate, kind of based on your experience, how do you find that most people fall into poverty? Because blame gets tossed around a lot. And I'm just well, to... there's a number of ways. That, uh, the question is, how do I find that people fall into poverty? Yeah. Uh, you know, my parents, we never had a whole lot of money. Uh, and in fact, on his deathbed, my father apologized to me for not leaving more. And I said, you know, you gave me an education. You know, you worked with me, you helped me through college and law school. You know, how could you leave me anything more? It's something, you know, I'll never lose it in the stock market. I might lose it, but not in the stock market. Uh, you know, if you look, there's certain indicators that uh, and this is really reading uh, sociology, there's certain indicators that are surefire signs. A young unmarried woman with a child, the probability of her living in poverty just goes right up. Uh, as a former criminal defense lawyer, go to jail when you're 20, come out when you're 22, and your chances of not being a recidivist not being involved in domestic violence, not being involved in drugs, getting a decent job, there, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, we try to work, and the Chief Sadler uh, has been uh, big on this, we're trying to work with a different program in the way of policing that we give some people breaks early on and breaks to the extent that to be sentenced to state mandatory prison sentences and offer them an opportunity to work it out as an example where somebody's made a mistake and done something stupid. When you're, no offense, but when you're 18 or 19 or 20, a lot of people have problems seeing the long-term ramifications of what they're doing. They do something and it's like, in my former practice, I used to represent F&M students. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it that way. And I'll also put it this way. Your parents were always good pay, too. Uh, you just give them the fee and they'd write the check. Uh, but it was always foolish things. It was, uh, so we've been working and the Chief's been working to, to try to develop programs to keep people that might have done something stupid from getting in the system. Once you're in the system, it's hard. I, I used to tell clients, it's easier to stay out of jail than it is to get out of jail. Once you're in, you're in. Uh, there's a book, uh, gee, I can't remember the sociologist's name from Harvard, uh, uh, More Than Just Race, who wrote a, a great book, uh, but really showed the facts and figures of what was going to lead, uh, lead you into that, uh, into that hole. So, and the other thing, too, if you look at studies that have been done, racial integration, which you know, we had a, a high school class that uh, was an African-American teacher who said he wanted to have an all-African-American homeroom group so he could be a mentor, and he would be a mentor. I know the guy. And, oh, people got up in arms. This is segregation. This is going back. And one of the people was somebody who wrote a letter from Manheim Township. And I almost wrote a letter back saying, well, if you want integration, why the hell don't you integrate your own schools instead of telling us what we should do in the city with specific problems? Really. But uh, uh, if you look at the most recent studies, economic integration, 
actually works better than racial integration, that if you bring poor kids, middle-class kids, kids that come from wealthier families and put them together, everybody moves up. Uh, we don't have that now, uh, especially, well, in Lancaster County, but damn near any place in Pennsylvania. You have the, the segregated, economic, ethnically, racially segregated school district, and then you have the white middle class districts around it. It's not healthy. It damages. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Crom. I'm on the faculty here, and I am blessed to live in the 100 block of North Mary Street. Awesome oh, block. Uh, Mary Street's just a nice it's street. It's great, period. although don't ask me about the Orange Street construction. Uh, that's gone That's UGI, <laughs> okay? It ain't, by the way, a lot of the streets in Lancaster are state streets, are state-owned highways. Chestnut Street, or not Chestnut, Walnut, Prince, Queen, uh, Orange Street are all state-owned and maintained roads. So, you know, That's I fought hard to get it paved. And then they told UGI, you can come in and put all these pipes in before we pave it. So and that's the meter's in the sidewalk and that stuff. Yeah. Anyway, my question is, as somebody who lives in Lancaster, cares about Lancaster, what is one thing that you would tell me you would like me to do to help out the city, to make things better? Well, well I think uh, combating a lot of stereotypes that... Uh, that people have about the city. I'm sure a lot of the students here come from big metropolitan areas where this is sort of like Paducahville. Uh, you know, we came from Pittsburgh and people were saying, are you sure it's safe where you're moving? People around here and we're there, what are you, crazy? Uh, you know, the stereotypes that linger about the city of Lancaster. For, uh, uh, I speak to rotary groups outside the city and every now and then somebody will ask me a question and I'll say to them, could you just think about that question and think about all the assumptions that you have in it? Uh, so, you know, I think combating stereotypes is one of the biggest things we can do. Every now and then I get somebody who says, oh, it's been 20 years since I've been in the city. I don't see any reason to go to the city. And I tell them, where do you live? And, they say Mount Joy. I say, well, it's been 25 years since I've been in Mount Joy, because <laughs> why would I go to Mount Joy? Uh, whenever I speak outside the city, I always start off with, there's no place to park here. Don't you people have any garages? <laughs> you know, and also, are you sure you're safe here? Are you sure you're safe? Uh, you know, the stereotypes, and a lot of them come from racial and ethnic stereotypes about the people that live in the city. Uh, we know from living 40 years on Prince Street, we know that it's just not that way. But uh, I'd say that, just make sure that people get the word that the city is a, a delightful, fun place to live and be. Well, that one's easy. <laughs> one one question, well, two questions. We'll take two questions and I'll try to be brief. Yeah. Okay, so my question has to do with money. Um, and the desirability of the city. Um, I'm a resident in the city. My children go to the public schools in the city. But I've heard, you know, many times from my faculty colleagues and others, like, oh no, I, I'm, you know, I need to go to the Hemphill School District or Mannheim or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that the school district is bleeding money and losing teachers and whatnot, and which will certainly not improve it and make it more desirable. Do yep. you know anything that can be done other than wait for Harrisburg? Well. You know, we have so many couples that move into the city, love it, live there four or five years, have a kid, the kid gets to be four and a half years old and they're looking for a place to live. Uh, a lot of that is stereotype, but not all of it. And we fight to improve the city schools and we fight to fund them. We have the highest tax rate in Lancaster County is in the city. Uh, the city itself is about 12 mills, and the school district's about double that. Uh, you know, I sent all three of my school kids to Fulton, to Reynolds, and McCaskey. All three of them went to college and graduated. Uh, they all got a good education, but it is a different kind of education. 
We intentionally moved into the city because of the schools, because we didn't want our kids going to a school where everybody they saw was vanilla, basically. Uh, that uh, we wanted them to be in an environment more like the environment that they uh, are going to live in when they leave. And I'll say this, our three kids, as compared to my sister's three kids who grew up in an all-white suburb of, uh, of Harrisburg, have a totally different outlook on life and a totally different relationship with people. So there's education and there's education. You can certainly get an excellent education through McCaskey. Uh, so we're fighting, we're fighting to improve it. That's about the best I can tell you, really. Yeah. Hi, my name's Graham Gibson. Um, and you mentioned a lot of really great initiatives to uh, help make the city greener. Um, I was wondering, like, what are you doing with power utilities to help encourage them to shift to greener sources rather than, say, coal or uh, uh, hydrocarbons? How are you, uh, are, is there any way you're encouraging them to switch to, like, solar farms or wind farms? Well, we've looked at uh, buying green energy. We use an awful lot of electricity, uh, just traffic lights and street lights and whatnot. But to be honest with you, we're so price-driven uh, that really we almost have to go with just whatever is the cheapest we can get for the longest period of time. Uh, we looked at a geothermal unit for the, uh, we're building an annex on City Hall, and we wanted to do geothermal there. Uh, we couldn't because, and we're not sure we weren't sold a bill of goods, but we couldn't because of the closeness of these other historic buildings around. They said that uh, we might disturb foundations and whatnot. That I don't understand, frankly. Uh, the new city hall itself is going to have a green roof and is going to be uh, LEED certified. We're trying to get a gold rating, but, uh, you know, between silver and gold, there's a, a lot of money involved. Uh, but as to utilities themselves, we are going to enact a right-of-way ordinance which will have utilities pay us for those pipes that they're putting in under the streets on Orange Street and pay us for the telephone lines uh, where they infringe on our right-of-way. But as to how we can direct them specifically, to be honest with you, I don't think we're big enough to do it, really. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.